finally getting warm. Yeah, it is. It's finally getting warm. Yeah, it, it's been just terrible. I haven't even been to the beach yet. No, neither have I. We went Sunday to, we walked, uh, we walked on the boardwalk on Sunday. It was really busy, um, but I haven't actually been to the beach. Yeah. No, that doesn't work. Good afternoon, everybody who's joining. It is just a minute or so before 4 p.m. So um, just bear with us. Um, we'll, you know, we'll do the formal introduction and launch the call in a minute. We'll just give a few more people a chance to join. Yeah, I wanted to go in the weekend, but it was just not tempting. Yeah, there was a lot of people. Oh, there were? Yeah, yeah. it was really busy. Yeah, I, I, got, I got a senior's beach badge this year. Oh dear. I'm kind of sad, yes, they yeah. give me the seniors one. <laughs> and it says senior on it. They're like, oh no. <laughs> All right, it yep. is four o'clock. Hang on, I should probably go back to the correct screen. screen. Um, okay, so I think let's, uh, we can uh, get started. Good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, Wednesday, 4 p.m. And this is our weekly COVID-19 update with the, in terms of the SBA um, and the various updates that Chris has been able to pull together throughout the week. We do this every Wednesday, so um, every Wednesday is slightly different topic, but always around uh, the PPP loans and um, anything else that we may have learned about forgiveness, etc. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, for those of you who join this call, you hear me say this every week, but for those of you who are new, just so you know, we don't use the raise hand function on here. We only use the Q&A. Uh, function. We do encourage questions. We take all, we'll take all your questions and we'll try and answer everything. So please do feel free to post questions using the Q&A function in the uh, Zoom app or on your computer. A uh, quick reminder that SCORE is a, a national entity. We are uh, funded by the SBA, but we are a free mentoring uh, agency. We offer uh, to businesses and we offer webinars and sem uh, seminars in usual times to businesses as well. So if anybody is looking for a mentor for their business, please go ahead and double check the score.monmouth.org website and register for a mentor. Um, that being said, oh, and one other thing, sorry, we are recording this, it's on Facebook Live and it will also go to um, our YouTube channel after the call or after the webinar. So if there's anything you missed or you wanted some clarification on, go ahead and check both of those places. And with that, I will hand over to Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Did we lose you, Chris? We may be having a slight technical difficulty, people, so just bear with us. I'm gonna double check with Chris, make sure he is um, not having uh, IT issues.
just so everybody knows, uh, Chris lost IT, lost uh, connectivity, but I see him dialing back in. So sorry about this. Just bear with us. Sorry, everyone. Chris is having a um, um, an internet connectivity issue. Um, so I hate to waste all everyone's time. He is going to fix it. He'll be back on in just a couple of minutes. I feel like I should probably do a dance or something, but I don't think anybody really wants to see that. So just uh, just bear with us. And I'm really sorry. So just whilst everyone's waiting, I can do another quick reminder about um, um, our webinars and seminars. Um, so we have a webinar program, which we run every Friday. This Friday, we have a program for, um, it's, oh, I should remember this now, I'm caught off, um, off guard, but uh, how to exit your business. So if anybody is looking to perhaps thinking about, you know, retiring or selling their business and what options may be out there for you, uh, we have a webinar on this Friday at 3 p.m. Um, and next Friday we have a webinar which is Google My Business and just talking about how you can get your your company set up. Nope, next Friday is a networking, is um, a woman who can talk about networking and how to network using uh, not just social media, but also physical networking and networking groups and, and how to present yourself. So keep an eye out on our webinars that are scheduled. And here, is Chris back? So I will allow him to uh, take over again. You're muted, Chris. All right, sorry about that, folks. I had to switch internet connections. So uh, let's get going again. Pretend that it never happened. Okay. So I was saying that uh, um, I was going to talk a little bit more about planning today um, than what I'm going to end up doing because um, the changes that the house pushed through to the program last week. Unfortunately, the Senate hasn't acted yet and we'll get into a little bit more about that. So we want, do want to talk about the new expected changes to the program and beyond of where we are right now, because eventually we're going to go and try to go back to be in business and do what we do. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into what the proposed changes to the PPP forgiveness program are, uh, and they are huge. The, the changes that are proposed are very big and it affects everybody who got money uh, quite a bit in terms of how we do it and what we do. Uh, as the house version sits right now, the eight weeks of a covered period will go to 24 weeks. And 
that, and it will be a choice for people if they want to stay with the original eight weeks or go to 24 weeks. And that also drives a couple of the other time frames. And the other big thing, two other big things, is that the 75% requirement of being payroll costs is being changed to being 60%. That's pretty darn big, but it's also a cliff. Uh, but the eight weeks going to 24, together with the 60% of being a payroll requirement rather than 75, makes a huge difference in how much we can get forgiven. Then what isn't get, got getting forgiven, the proposal from the House going to the Senate is that the payback goes from two years to five years. That makes a huge difference in how much is going to get payback per month. So let's do a little recap um, for where we were. And I think most people are beyond this. So I'm going to go through it pretty quick. Uh, monies uh, in the PPP, PPP program are still available. Uh, I don't know exactly how much, but the last I saw, which is a couple of days ago now, uh, was somewhere between 75 and 100 billion still left in the program. The people pulling down has slowed down a little bit. And I would say with five years, even you get nothing forgiven, it's still cheap money. It's 1% money, no personal guarantee, no collateral, and a recourse for you personally only if you misuse the funds or lie in the application. And as we see, it gets forgiven. So let's talk about forgiveness a little bit and remind her again about sole proprietors, which we're not going to really focus on, but on that, still haven't seen anything different than really what happens is that 75% of the sole proprietor's loan get forgiven basically automatically. And I don't know if the eight weeks going to 24 weeks for the non-payroll part of it for sole proprietors. Don't know that yet. And we won't know probably until it goes through the Senate and SBA sits down and writes out what the fine-tuned rules are, whatever that's going to be. So what's still there and this is probably the most important thing about all of this, is that there is still going to be an application. It's going to look pretty much the way it is. I don't see that they're going to redo it. But for, if you want forgiveness of these loans, you have to apply for it. It's not going to be automatic in any way, shape, or form. The basics of what it looks like hasn't changed. The time frames are changing. And here again, a little bit of a refresher course, what we talked about the other day. For the people I've spoken to in between last week and this week, this concept most people are actually getting, and I'm very pleased to see and hear that. The covered period is the eight weeks going to 24, if you choose to do so, or something in between. We, we'll talk a little bit about that. And that is the period of time that you are looking to add up your payroll for the forgiveness amount. Reference periods is what you look back and compare to for if you decreased your personnel, you decreased your employee base with what they call the full-time equivalents. And then there will be modifications based on the full-time equivalents. The same for wage and hour reductions by person, where you're still going to have to compare a person that you paid in the covered period, did you in decrease their compensation rate, compensation rate by more than 25%. I haven't heard a whole lot of people who have done that. I have heard of, I know some people who right away went in and said, I'm going to keep the people, I have some business, and I'm going to pay them 50%. That 
company is going to get hurt by that because the pay rate went down. Obviously, labor laws still are in effect. You can't pay less than minimum wage under any circumstance. There's still going to be the employee tables that we went through the last week, and there's still going to be the safe harbors. Some of those time frames in the safe harbors will change because of the change of a timetable. And here is what you will see change. Obviously, the covered period, if that goes from eight to 24 weeks, that it also means that they have moved the safe harbor calculation that was that the week of 630 to become the week of 1231. And good or bad, and for people who are seasonal employers, uh, might or might not be good or bad. It depends on how much you think you're going to have. And But 1231 also gives you more time to plan it out. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Then you have number 10 here, the last week of covered period. That's obviously going to change if we stretch out to eight weeks to be 24 weeks. Everything else is really staying the same. The basis, payroll cost, actual gross pay, state and local payroll taxes, health, uh, health benefits that employer pays for, and retirement benefits that the employer pays for. That's the basis. And then the eligible expenses that we talked about many times, the rent, utilities, and business interests. Still saying the same. That has not changed. All that's changed now are the things we talked about. So what do the changes mean? Well, the big one is here, obviously, that much, much easier to get full or near full forgiveness. When you take the eight, eight weeks, I am going to have eight weeks to be able to do regular course payroll to get my whole forgiveness. When that stretches to 24 weeks, I obviously have a lot more time to get to that full amount. And that is exactly what it is. You have a choice. You can stay with the eight weeks or go to, or go to the 24. And we'll cover that a little bit later. The two year payback to five years is also, if you fail to actually get started up in a reasonable way, there's a, everything goes wrong. You can't get forgiveness of the whole amount. What's left over is stretched to five years. If I understand it correctly, the max pay, and this affects those of you who carry yourself as an owner, as an employee, that the max person that you can actually forgive, max amount goes from 15,000 to 46,000 because it goes to 40 to 24 weeks. Uh, that hasn't been specifically said, but nothing else makes sense. Um, also, as we said, they only need 60% to be payroll related. So now, just take an easy example. If you got $100,000 as a loan, PPP loan, so now to get the whole thing forgiven, given that you have other expenses to fill it up, what you need to do in the 24 weeks is to get to $60,000 in payroll cost. Then if you have $40,000 in other costs that are eligible, then you get the whole thing forgiven. It's not the 25, 75 anymore. However, the way it's being expressed is that if you don't get to 60%, you don't get any forgiveness. It's a cliff. 
It's not prorated. If you get the 59%, find somebody to pay a thousand bucks because you're not going to get forgiven. You got to get to the 60% to be forgiven. Uh, the safe harbor from 630 to 1231 for those calculations. And uh, <laughs> if you select the 24 weeks. What else? Um, still all the payroll periods are there. Still have to apply. If you go to the 24 weeks, the FTE calculation that we covered last week, when we look at the full-time equivalents, will now span over 24 weeks. So you end up taking 24 weeks, the average full-time equivalents there compared to the average for the first quarter. Now, um, then the same go, uh, sorry, average for FT, let's go back here again. I'm uh, getting late in the day, I'm getting tired. Um, the comparison there, remember, was the 215 to 426 compared to the week of 215. Um, then you go to, um, go to 630 Harbor, etc. But now the FTE is for 24 weeks. The average pay rate comparison is now for also for 24 weeks compared to the, four, the, uh, the first quarter, which means there is a longer record keeping period. However, and that's where you should have talked to your payroll company already about getting that set up. What I hear is that the payroll companies are having a hard time actually getting it right. Eventually they're gonna to have to get that because I don't know how we're gonna get it done otherwise. Uh, I've tried for a couple of operations I'm involved in to actually start doing the calculation, dump it down from payroll, etc. Our payroll companies, two different ones, have not been able to actually get it right yet. They're working on it as I think all of them are. And hopefully the big ones like ADP, et cetera, have actually been able to master it. And then the last week of the covered period, still the safe harbor. What I've gotten a couple of questions about in the week is that, is it eight weeks, do I select eight weeks within the 24 weeks? No, it's not. It's either the original eight weeks or it is the 24 weeks. And at this point, all the other in payroll pairs in this schedule we've been looking at are the same. Here is, is what could be a difficult issue for some people. The requirement or permissible use of funds is still there. And that had an expiration date of 630. And is that going to change for 630 or not? We don't know. Hopefully not, because then after that expiration date, you are then permitted to use the money the way you want. I'm suspecting that SBA is going to extend that. So look out uh, how you use money here. Uh, and if it goes to 24 weeks, the SBA will now have more time to actually figure out how to check on things. So be careful there. Um, if you are planning to buy both, then you're gonna buy with what could be looked at as PPP money. I would say be careful and be aware of the expiration date of that requirement. Claire, should we take some questions? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Let's uh, 
let's go ahead. So we have, uh, I got a portal to get more EIDL dollars after advance of the, of the 9,000. Will that amount be subtracted from what they are now offering us? If the question is, will EIDL money be subtracted from the forgiveness of the PPP, the, the grant part of that, the first portion of the money that we got will be deducted by SBA from the forgiven amount. There again, if you recall going back a couple of times in looking at the application for forgiveness, don't deduct it yourself. It's up to SBA to do that. But if they are on the ball, yes, it will be. That portion of it, not the whole EIDL. Um, then we have, um, how soon after I get PPP dollars do I have to start spending? Day of. Day the of. Eight weeks as it currently stands starts the day you get the funding or you have the option to move the payroll portion of it to the next first start of the payroll period. So if you get, if you got the money on a Tuesday, your pay week, your payroll period starts on Mondays, you could move the start of the payroll dollars that you count to that next Monday. But basically, yeah, it's immediately. Once you get the money, you ha don't have the option to pick the eight weeks. Just like you won't have the option to pick the 24 weeks. Um, so if you are uh, an independent or an LLC and you filed on your Schedule C and you don't have a specific payroll date, you just kind of pay your owner's uh, owners drawings, you know, yeah. as and when, how does that work? Do you just sort of take the eight weeks and do, um, and apply that over two months? Uh, let's see here. Uh, we go back to this, this, we go back. No, nope. we go back to somewhere. I had that slide here. Well, I can't find it now. So let's talk, let's just talk about it. And that is they, if you are a LLC where you have partners, you don't have any actual payroll. It's the same basic treatment as a sole proprietor. Uh, but you go off the schedules basically off K1s. But if you are a single, if you're a single LLC, single member LLC, then it's the same thing as a sole proprietor. That basically the 75% of what you got is automatically forgiven. I don't know yet what the application will look like for that. Uh, but that is what they have done. That basically, if you're a sole proprietor, we assume that you're going to pay yourself. So 75% of that is forgiven. And then if you have additional eligible expenses, you can apply that. Okay. Um, just back to the EIDL question about the $9,000. Uh, uh -huh. the, the, the EIDL advance was 9,000. So would that be subtracted from any new EIDL funds they are offering? No, they won't. What, well, that, or no, uh, that, I, my experience is that no, it was not. Uh, I'm involved in two companies that got money. In both cases, they got the first grant, they got the 10 grand, then they got an additional 15 grand. The 15 grand got deducted from the total eventual EIDL money. The 10 did not. 
And I am confused on that because I thought it would, but based on those two experiences, I would say no. But uh, again, I also have seen that things are not completely applied equally all over the place. This is a quick program. There are holes and there are people, uh, depends on who is your person you deal with there or who does it. Okay. Um, how does the PPP affect the, the new NJEDA grant that can be applied for on June the 9th? I don't see that it does. I, I don't see that it has any bearing. I haven't read the fine, the, the fine uh, read of it, uh, but first look, see, I, I don't see that it does. And then we have, and I wonder if this is the same or if this is relevant. Are you familiar with the new Main Street program and how it works and when to apply? I am not. I haven't had a chance to actually look at it um, but I will and I will send something out when I find out I am not complete I've seen it I know it's there I don't know the specifics okay um, there was a question once I got approved for PPP um, should I stop my unemployment um, Unemployment is based on whether you are getting paid. And there, it's an interesting question. I've had it a couple of times during the week. Uh, the first one is, what kind of entity are you? If you are a corp or an LLC where you get paid at, you pay yourself as an employee and you start paying yourself, then yes, the employ unemployment should stop. Uh, if you are a sole proprietor, I don't know. I, I don't have the answer. Um, I suspect it could depend on who is actually reviewing the case. Uh, for those who are more conservative nature, I, then I would probably say that, yeah, it probably does. And I think it's up to each one's interpretation. She's an LLC. And then it becomes it's a single member LLC or paying herself for as an employee. And if you're paying if yourself- If she's paying herself- Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, if you're paying yourself as an employee, then that would kind of negate the unemployment. It, it, would, it would, because then you are paid. You are getting a paycheck, and you shouldn't do both. Uh, not as she's not paying herself as an employee. It's an interesting question. Oh. I don't. She. So, so yes. She, so she's got the PPP money based on the um, her Schedule C. And then a uh, question, the assumption is that you are paying yourself during this period of time where this is given. Then the interesting question becomes, this gets elongated to 24 weeks. Then the question is, when are you actually paying yourself? And this is where your own personal choices come in, actually, I think because this is 24 weeks and you say, okay, so I paid myself here in week 16 to 24 and I collected unemployment in week one to six. Uh, somebody's going to be able to say that those are actually overlapping. I don't know. Uh, just so you know, Claire, you have all kinds of lights coming in. Oh, I do. Do I look like, do I look angelic? Yes, you do. Excellent. 
Um, I, I will fix that. Let me. I'm going to pass another question, and then I'm going to um, I'm going to fix that whilst um, you take the next question. So, okay. and the question is, how is the best way to determine how long you should take for forgiveness? Can you do every? Can you even do twelve or sixteen weeks? Yeah. What should determine that? No. Uh, well, so now let's go in and first look at eight weeks or 24 weeks. That's actually my next slide. So the pro, I'm just going to talk pro because the flip side is obviously the cons. The, eight, the pro of the eight weeks is if you already reached full forgiveness, you didn't have any FT reductions, you have no pay rate reduction, then I would just go for the eight weeks cut off the record keeping worry, all that stuff, go on with life. That's what I would do. Now, uh, and it may be easier for a seasonal business provided that you have the business and you can get to the expenses. You, you have to count what, what you think it's gonna be. Now, the 24 week pro, obviously easier to reach full forgiveness and it's easier to plan the safe harbors in that scenario. And uh, I think I have that on the next one, yes. So when you look at the safe harbors, comparing the FD, comparing to the week of 215. So then if you go through your whole 24 week period, or if you do that and you say, eh, you know, I'm not going to get there. So now you have 1231 and I'm just going to take easy numbers. So if I have 20 employees in the week of 215 and for the 24 weeks I go and I'm realizing I'm going to probably only have 17 full-time equivalents. Now you have to actually kind of sit down pen and paper and say, okay, so on 12.31, I'm kind of in the retail business. I'm going to get really busy. So I think I'm going to have 19 in the week of 12.31. I'm just going to hire another person. So whatever you pay for a person, it doesn't matter how much they're paid, what they do, or if anything, just pay them. It could be minimum wage. They count, pay, work 40 hours. They count as a full-time employee. employee. For that week of 12.31, you are now up to 20 and you have a safe harbor. You don't have to worry about it. Now, to go back to the second part of that question is that uh, the, it is either the eight weeks, the original eight weeks or the 24 weeks. There is no such thing that you can elect 16 or elect 20 or elect 12, um, not so. Uh, you have to do one or the other. Now, we don't really know that it's going to be 24 weeks. There is a question mark. Two senators are holding out for the 24 weeks. They want to cut it at 8.15, which in a couple of cases that I know would make it another eight or nine weeks or 16, 17 weeks, depending on when you got the money. So there's probably going to be some negotiations and going to be somewhere in between. So probably somewhere between 16 and 24 weeks, but whatever it is, it's going to be either the eight or that number. Okay. Um... Then we have a question, if, can, can somebody apply for EIDL if one does, if they do translation and interpreting for agriculture, agricultural companies such, such as Spanish into English language? Um, I don't know. And I would say the best way to find out is to try. The application doesn't take long to do. And if you don't fit the industry code, they're going to kick you out pretty quick. So I would try it. I would absolutely try it. Okay. Um, 
then we have uh does the president uh of the u.s have to okay these changes proposed by the house and maybe by the senate yeah um, but the administration have already signaled very strongly that whatever gets put to the desk will be signed so it's a question of what happens in the senate that, that's my reading of it. There's nothing for sure, obviously, uh, but this, whatever is going to come out, is going to be a bipartisan bill. And I don't see that there would be any precedent, any strike at any time that wouldn't do this. That would be a disaster for anybody. Um, okay, and then we have... Um... Do you have more slides, Chris? Do you want to take some more slides, or do we, we have a couple more questions for you? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll go through. I'm going to change uh, change direction a little bit because we are now here in going on two months in this environment, and we have gotten the money most. Of us, there are still people who are trying to get it, but the ones that have gotten the money, we're going to start looking forward. What's going to happen? Uh, and um, as any time, uh, I think we're going to start then looking at starting up our operations again. Uh, I'm going through it with a couple of our managers, and uh, that you got to get a checklist together. You got to figure out what it is that you need to do. What do they have to do to start up? Both from a regulatory standpoint, safety standpoint, and from a business standpoint. What do you have? What do you need? Do you already have uniform to people? Uh, are the trucks in condition to actually work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the things and you need to put dollars to it. So there's planning that has to go into now more than ever. And as everywhere, all the time, every time you're gonna try, take a trip, it's much easier to do it if, if you have a map or nowadays a navigation system that tells you where to go. And if you tell yourself to start with, you lay out the roadmap so that you can recognize where the bumps in the roads are it's a heck of a lot easier. Or you can just select not to do that and bang your head against the wall. And that's also a choice, not one that I would recommend. Um, a couple of other things that I see, I have spoken to bankers in the last couple of days, and it looks to me and what I read that access to capital could get stickier from now on. Um, looking for capital for a couple of companies and the bankers were really curious to see and hey, what kind of revenues, where is it going to go? Um, what's your cash flow going to be here this fall, etc. And it seems like they are getting stingier and they are getting having a harder time looking at their covenants. So I would say if you're sitting there now, if you are in a situation, you have a line of credit, I would use it. I would pull down the line of credit and put it in the back. Um, that's what we did. Um, and uh, I would also look out for these people who call and start talking about PPP, who are not PPP. And they're just pretending, some of them, not all, they're legit, et cetera, but some of them are just pure MCAs. And they start talking about PPP money and then quickly go into MCAs and want to sell you MCAs. Um, look out for that. Uh, then most of us, unless we got a lot of PPP and EIDL money so we don't have to worry about it, or we, are, we have a lot of money to start with. And some people do, most people in this world do not. So we are still in 
a situation where the market or our market we selling into our customer base isn't back we are going to have to look at our cash flow and there again we covered this several weeks ago and nothing has really changed this is just any other cash crunch and a crisis with two twists we have an excuse and the creditors get it they're not going to say what's going on they they get it and i would still look at especially with a 24 window cut all outflows make your plan and look what you can do no of course you cannot cut payroll that's already incurred if you have sales people who earned commission last month and you paid them this month you got to pay them it's illegal not to so you can't cut out that kind of stuff but i would look at do i need everybody on my payroll what expenses can i cut and i would run the business very conservatively and i would make a plan now i make a plan with numbers and do roll forwards and all that kind of stuff but i have we have the accounting resource to do it for smaller businesses just do power and just do bullet point plan and try to figure out okay you know in the next month how much money am I going to take in and what revenues are going to have? What am I going to collect? Give or take. It's better to guess an approximate than not have anything. And then start looking at, okay, so if I have that, what can I pay out? And if you discover that, oh, I don't have enough money to pay all my bill. Now you go to your creditors. You look at who can I talk to? Who can help me preserve my cash? I can go to the landlord and I can tell the landlord, listen, you're gonna to have to help me in the next three months. If you do, I'll be back. I can see here in my numbers that I will be able to, in three months, start to get up, back up, and then I can pay you the 70, 80,000 a year or whatever it is um, that you pay in rent going forward. If you force me to pay my rent now in the next three months, I won't be four months. These are conversations to be had with your creditors. So help, so tell the creditors, help me be a good customer to you again by helping me now. Otherwise you may lose me forever. That is a transparent conversation that in that case needs to be had. If you have credit facilities, call your banker and say, you gotta keep deferring my loan. I'm not there. My business is not up and running. Uh, I can't, can't do it and have the conversation. Yes. And as we said several weeks ago, money in, more friends and family, don't do it unless you think you can actually bounce back. Uh, there is no reason to just put good money after bad money, right? And I know that is a tough conversation to have, tough thing to do, and you can't do it without actually sitting down and do some kind of an outline of the plan. Can't have a conversation with creditors without having thought it through because they're gonna ask, well, how much are you gonna, do you think you're gonna, gonna uh, how much revenues do you think you have? But what are you gonna collect? What's gonna be income? And if you don't know, you don't have a credible conversation. Um, keep in contact with the customers. If you're in a business where it is B2B, keeping contact with the customer. Make sure they're there when you get up running. Make sure they're there when you want to expand. And then again, unless you know you're going to get the big bounce, don't fall for the MCIs. But here again, you have the personal guarantees. And 
the world is in such that they forget that you have personal guarantees. If you sign personal guarantees, they will file UCC, they will go after your house. So make sure you understand what you do when you do those kind of high interest, right? It's a monster. If you get going, you take $50,000 and you pay back over, you pay back $70,000 over four months. All of a sudden you're gonna find yourself very quickly, oh, the money went, I need more. Then you go and get another one. So all of a sudden, all your money is going to MCAs. And then lastly there, communicate with staff, customers, creditors, everybody. Uh, that's the best way to get breaks from people. Okay, more questions? I had a quick question and then I'll, I'll go through the questions that are here. Can, um, can the banks, if you personally guarantee a credit line, can they take your primary residence if it's your primary house? Look what the UCC says when they file them. They could have filed. Uh, houses are, are a little bit different animal and I'm not an expert in it. I, I have seen it from kind of a user perspective. I'm not a banker, um, but yes, if they had gone in and put a lien, lien on your house, if you sign a piece of paper when you do the loan that says that they can do that, chances are that they went in and did it and then they can go after your house. So you, get a little, you can go to the state and look to see what UCCs and liens have been filed on you. Those are public records and it's all online nowadays. Um, there was a question, is there a, um, is there a way to check, and I'm not sure if we can answer this, but I'll, I'll pose the question. Is there a way to check on my elig eligibility for unemployment as a gig worker who has successfully filed? I have heard nothing and I have no clue how to check my status. I don't know other than what we heard is that the gig workers have become eligible for the unemployment. I don't know, I guess you can keep, keep checking. I know it's hard to get through and all those kind of things, um, but you're supposed to be eligible both for the state unemployment and for the extra kicker from the federal government, the 600 bucks. Um, and then we have, if I'm on payroll and I also have my K-1, how do I pay myself with the PPP? Um, if the PPP was, if both the K-1 and the payroll were the basis for it, then you do both. You have both the K-1 portion of it would be the automatically forgiven portion. Question is, is your bank going to be, who is servicing the loan going to be on the ball and understand it? You're gonna to have to be insisting, etc. If you have a K-1 and you didn't use it, you didn't use your K-1 to get the loan, then it's all employment. Okay. Um, then we have, I had five employers last year, two for one day. Do I need to have three, even though I only had one consistent worker? Does it go by employee, the hours or the dollar amounts? Of what we were talking uh, about. Take, take, yeah, take one at a time. Uh, the first one is in terms of full-time equivalents. Um, from that perspective, it doesn't matter what you did last year, unless you select that look back period. Um, let's see if I can find a slide. I haven't been good at finding slides here today. Uh, here. So here are, not, uh, you are now, look, there we go. Uh, so here are the pay periods that you're looking at. And when you look at, five, six, and seven, those are the three look back periods that you select. 
to compare yourself to. So uh, what you're gonna happen is that you're gonna take the period for the covered period, figure out what the full-time equivalents are, which means that if you have just three employees, one worked 30 hours on the average, one worked 40 hours on the average, and the next one worked um, 20 hours on the average. You now have on the average uh, 0 .70, 0 0.75 full-time equivalents. You add them up, one is 0 0.75, one is one, and one is 0 0.75, you add them up. And then you do the same thing for the comparison period. So, um, so that was 0 0.75, one and a half, you have now two and a half full-time equivalent. So now you do the same for the period of time you compare it to. Uh, so that is not employees, it's full-time equivalent and you can't go over 40 hours. You can't, nobody can have more than one. Um, then you have the average pay and that is it looks at who you have in the covered period of time and see if you paid rate for that person was less than 75% of the first quarter in this year. So those are the ones that you have. Um, and then the, there was just an addendum to that question, which was part-time as needed. Uh, part-time is part-time and it's the full-time equivalent of that part-timer. That part-timer worked 20 hours that's half a full-time equivalent. Now I can complicate and go in and say that you have an option to take all the less than 40 hours of equivalents and make them all half. Most ones I've seen that doesn't pay. It pays only if your average is less than half for that. If you have a lot that works 25, 26, 27 hours, you're better off actually calculating it. Okay, and then we have one more question, which is if I take more EIDL money, how much can I get without collateral or personal credit? If it is more than 25,000, I think it's 25,000 and up, they will have a personal guarantee and they will collateralize it. And if that is what it means is that if you're a sole proprietor, you're collateralizing with yourself and your own personal properties. Uh, if you're a company, then it's the company's assets, but you will have a personal guarantee if it's over 25,000. Okay, and I think um, I see a couple of raised hands. So if you had raised your hand, if you could just, um, if you have a question, just pop it in the, uh, in the, in the Q and A. Uh, and we don't have any more questions right now, Chris. So I don't know if, did you okay. have anything you wanted to cover? No, I'm, I'm talked out. Yeah, <laughs> I get it, I get it. Um, and it's five to five. So I think if you don't, if there's no yeah. more questions to be had right now, I think um, we can probably, oh, it's actually 4.57. So um, it's good timing. So I think what I'll say is thanks everybody for joining. We, we appreciate it. Oh, look, one, oh, just a thank you. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. We do appreciate it. Um, and yeah. we're having these calls every week on Wednesdays at four for the foreseeable future until we, uh, Till we have some stability in what's happening with the PPP and the SBA, etc. Also, just a reminder, we have our Friday webinars. Um, they are covering a variety of topics that are not SBA related, but small business related and um, cover things like networking and running your business and social media. If you check our Facebook page or our website, uh, you'll, or even Eventbrite and Meetup, we have them all listed on there. So after this meeting or after this webinar, you'll get an email with the um, presentation that Chris did today and a link to our Facebook page and our website. So you'll be able to check them. Encourage you to join, invite your friends to join, uh, spread the word. 
reminder that SCORE is a free mentoring service for businesses. So if you are looking for a mentor for your business, please check out our website at monmouth.score.org and um, you'll be able to see a list of the local mentors. If you need uh, somebody outside of what you see listed on our website and you don't think you found someone with the skill set, just reach out anyway because we have a large network of people and we'll be able to bring in the skill sets that you need. Uh, and on that, Chris, anything else you want to add? Um, no, other than go out and um, figure out what your business needs and make the most out of the money you got from EIDL and PPP. Um, and now when we know it's going to be more than eight weeks in one way or the other, it sure seems that way. I would be very surprised otherwise. Don't make big decisions about spending money just to spend money to get forgiveness. You may need it for actual business and it won't hurt you. Great. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a Thanks, great everybody. Have a great have a evening. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.